Greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood Podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on YouTube. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? Tango Shalom is now available on, on all, all VOD, VOD major platforms. platforms. <laughs> I think we missed that. Up. Video on demand, or as they say in the trade, VOD. VOD. Uh, Tango, Tango Shalom, Shalom is now, is now available, available on all, all VOD platforms. platforms, which means video on demand. Look how you know. You must be a high school graduate. I'm a college graduate. Really? Yes. I got an honorary degree from Hofstra. My, did you get an honorary degree? No, I got a degree. <laughs> oh, well, I got an honorary. You know, I'm in the Jewish Museum. What for? What do you mean? As a famous Jew in you the are? Bronx. I'm in the famous... I have a, I'm in the Prospect Park in the, in the stones. How big is the stone? <laughs> Observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your evangelist of the imagination, and of course the still yet undefined existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, me, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I am coming to you, you, you imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the Post Geek Singularity, and remember, as always, Rob Casting, and this is, what is this? It's Rob Observations episode number 767. Before we start, I wanted to note the passing of a legend in the entertainment business, Martha D. Lorenis. Uh, she passed away at 67 years of age. She was an American film and TV producer and wife to Dino De Laurentiis. The, uh, what more needs to be said about Dino De Laurentiis, one of the most legendary film producers of all time, after a long battle with cancer. According to Brian Fuller, who worked with Martha De Laurentiis on Hannibal, of course, she died peacefully with her family at her side. The expansive producing resume of Martha De Laurentiis, who was credited as Martha Schumacher until 1995, includes such films as Breakdown, U571, Hannibal, Red Dragon, Hannibal Rising with her late husband, and the 2013 TV series adaptation of Hannibal, developed and produced by Brian Fuller. Brian says, I met Martha De Laurentiis 10 years ago. He said in a statement to Deadline, she welcomed me into her home, fed me perfectly cooked pasta, overwhelmed with ripe white truffles as I professed to her my love for Hannibal Lecter, the cannibal psychiatrist. I'm writing now to profess my love and deep admiration for Martha, the canny producer. Through decades of on-the-ground, in-the-trenches filmmaking, she evolved a signature style, smart, tasteful, elegant, respectful, and present. Always positive and always pulled together. She read every draft of every script, was on set every opportunity, and she was the most glamorous cheerleader anyone could ask for. Martha supported the storytellers with all her might, every artist, every craftsperson. She treated us all like family. Martha De Laurentiis has been, and always will be, the matriarch. In 1980, Martha and Dino De Laurentiis, who passed away in 2010, founded the Dino De Laurentiis Production Company, on which she, she served as chairman. Martha D. Lorenz's recent producing credits include the 2018 feature Arctic. Fittingly, her last movie is the upcoming Firestarter, a reboot of D. Lorenz's very first movie as a producer, the 1984 big screen adaptation of the Stephen King novel. With her husband Dino, whom she married in 1990, Martha D. Lorenz had two daughters, Carolina and Dina. Memorial plans were not immediately available. Um, I actually met Martha D. Lorenz twice, thanks to Mr. Fuller 
and she actually she didn't know me from Adam, but she acted like I was the most important person in the room while we spoke. So rest in peace, Martha. You set the tone that we can only all aspire to producing movies in this crazy business. And on that note, I wanted to get into today's topic. And I have to say that you all know that I read Richard Rushfield's The Ankler. I read it religiously. If you don't, you should subscribe to it. It is a great uh, newsletter about the entertainment business. And I, you know, I, I've, I've learned a lot from him. And I appreciate his entire attitude toward the business, which he, he loves. So uh, it's not surprising then that I want to share uh, something that he wrote on in his latest newsletter. Because I think it's very, very important. And it is 2022, the disappearance of Hollywood as we know it. This comes from Richard Rushfield on December 4th, yesterday. He writes, I had the notion to do a more upbeat holiday spirit sort of issue after a good run in the gloom and doom vein of late. I've been looking for shreds of evidence to contradict my sense that this weekly box office game of grabbing at straws is a harbinger of the end of the studios as we know them. But every Sunday reading the box office reports is like the record of a mass delusion of a cult leader attempting to keep the acolytes calm and obedient while 10 feet away, the house goes up in flames. Two years in, we're still doing this dance every weekend, looking at what would be any standards, heretofore a round of mediocre at best to horrendous results, and squinting, holding the paper up sideways, burning sage around it to declare, look, people want movies. The audiences will come charging back. They'll find the perfect balance between VOD and theatrical that will create a new virtuous circle. Once more product gets in the market, it will ignite a pent-up wave of movie going like nothing we've ever seen. And next summer, there's going to be so many great movies, we'll have to build extra emergency multiplexes to hold the spillover audiences. And then Bob and Terry and Michael Eisner will operate on Melrose and grant unlimited charge accounts at the reopened Mortons to everyone. And the assistants can go to Chaya. It could happen. Anything's possible. Unpredictable times. But then I looked at the charts at the suggestion of a wise industry savant friend. Herewith are the stock charts of the legacy studios and their corporate parents. Let's take a look at these now, shall we? Here is the Walt Disney Company. Over a brief period of time, look at where we are at. Yeah. Here is Comcast, NBC Universal. Mm-hmm. That's right. And here we have Discovery Incorporated, now half of Warner Brothers, or all of Warner Brothers, however you want to look at it. And here is Viacom, CBS, the current makers of things like, oh, I don't know, Star Trek Discovery. Yeah. Okay, so stocks go up, stocks go down. Why should we believe Wall Street's next quarter mindset versus the all-seeing, long-range strategic genius of our great studio leaders whose vision and planning for? <gasps> See, that's where this train of thought choo-choos right off the cliff. Since I started, this is again Richard Rushfield talking, since our writing. This, I, uh, since I started this little adventure writing The Ankler, the driving narrative has been my quest to find out what's the plan. Three years later, I'm no closer to an answer. If there's a plan, the Poobahs have done a pretty great job burying it in some corner of the desert, so desolate that even the lizards won't disturb it. Wall Street might be short-sighted, but at least they're looking five feet down the road versus, I don't know, why don't we make another Jumanji? And if it's bad, maybe Apple will buy it from us. So you know whose legacy charts, do you know whose legacy charts so, you know who the legacy charge, can I even speak? So, you know who the legacy charge, charge, charts don't look like? This. Here's Netflix's stock. Yeah. That's right. Here's Amazon's stock. Mm -hmm. 
And here is Apple's stock. Yep, the big streamers right there, as opposed to our legacy studios. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not so good. Not looking good there, people. Not looking good. Richard Rushfield continues. So maybe Wall Street sees something. Look, I'm a king of the short-sighted Wall Street has no idea what creates lasting value in entertainment. So I'm not even speaking to the wisdom of the markets here, but the fact that this is a war of total insane spending. And those charts above represent the war chest and the varying states thereof. Maybe there's a path forward in theory, but for our great legacy studios, they've got these two big problems. And by problems, I'm talking about potentially the cratering of the entire theatrical business and the disappearance of cable revenue as well as the syndication fees, licensing fees, and everything else that rolls off creating hit broadcast TV shows. That part is very important. Neither of these things is certain, but they're both looking plausible enough that you'd have to set the crystal ball tracker at leans toward catastrophe. So on paper, a nimble, adroit, fearless, visionary leadership could manage the transition from their entire business model to something new, subscription-based, maybe blended releases. In theory, you could turn that aircraft carrier around if you perfectly executed the turn. But does that strike you as what's happening anywhere? Richard says, I've written a lot recently about the situation with movies, and I won't rehash it all except to say the argument against them disappearing looks more and more like wishful thinking. Again, a few quotes from last week's box office reports. Still being graded on a curve because, hello, we're still in a pandemic and there's still headlines of new variants every day with movie theaters checking vax cards in box office capitals like Los Angeles and New York City. Remember, some people refuse to be vaccinated and everyone's still wearing masks. Yesterday, the Dow dropped 900 points in its worst day from fears of new COVID variant B11529. I'm convinced the moment the mask mandate is lifted and life is declared safe is when that older adult audience will come roaring back. Make that an abundance of moviegoers, particularly the crowd that doesn't come on opening weekend. That was from Deadline. Grading on a curve much? We are going through weekend after weekend pretending that releases that would have been disasters three years ago are hits on a curve. Dune is a runaway success, grossing roughly the same as the catastrophic Blade Runner 2049. Encanto's opening would have been a pre-COVID meltdown, but today we call it a smash hit, which moves us to the other pillory, pillar of, not pillory, which moves us on to the other pillar of legacy studio cash flow, TV money. With all of the attention paid over the last few years to the mega deals for library titles and back catalogs, unremarked is the fact that broadcast TV has stopped creating the new Seinfelds, Modern Families, and Law and & Order that would create tomorrow's mega deals. This river is running dry. All that is to be replaced by the mystery pot of subscription profits that will be left over after funding a multi-billion dollar productions arms race. Godot is more likely to show up first. The question is, how do you turn your legacy entertainment conglomerate into that business? From 40,000 feet, I'd say it will come, the only sure thing is that it will come from their sale to one of those companies whose stock trend lines are green. If Warner Brothers ends up a division of Apple someday, instead of being owned by Discovery, how is that any skin off our collective schnoz? If Comcast sold NBC and or Universal to Roku, or to Uber, or to the Bored Apes Yacht Club, Brian Roberts can't stop bearing peacock data like bad hair under a baseball hat in the company's earnings call. The inevitability of the legacy Hollywood studios just becoming part of the IP production mechanism of tech overlords seems inevitable. And then every CFO of every major legacy studio can cash in their 20% return over 20 years in stock and stop waking up with worry at 4.30 a.m. But the flip side, if we ever totally swallow the pill of a tech-governed, streaming-centric industry, a few things are going to be changing around here. Whatever you say about Red Notice, weekly 200 million high-end action films, 
are going not going to be a weekly feature of this world in the long run. When these movies are made to be watched on the little screen, neither the economics nor the picture quality is going to support this. Multi-season shows will disappear as well. Almost a decade into the streaming era, how many shows have gone more than two seasons, more than three? Out of 10,000 at-bats, I bet we could name them all if we tried. Watching entertainment on devices means Hollywood's traditional high production is just one swipe away from other distractions. TikTok, texts, games. Young people do not consider this their primary entertainment. One of these days, that's going to have to be faced up to by whoever owns the place. All of which is to say, the new era is coming. Maybe all at once in some great collapse, maybe in more gulps of the pie, Wall Street appears to think the handoff is at hand. I'm not even mentioning the IATSE battle as the tiny little preview of the upheaval ahead, or even the oh my god Omicron situation we find ourselves in currently. And that's all based upon the stock market never having a general collapse. A global event that brings Netflix to something more like normal valuation. That might even make the Apples and the Amazons feel like billions aren't just pocket change anymore. And if that happens, hoo boy. So I read this. Rushfield's a very intelligent guy. He really, uh, his industry analysis is pretty damn spot on. Um... So I actually reached out to my industry guru friend, and I assure you, this person uh, is one of the most knowledgeable and one of the most successful producers currently working in Hollywood today. And I want to thank him for allowing me to, well, <laughs> send him questions, and he actually answers them on his busy, on his busy, uh, he, he's, the guy works seven days a week on incredible projects, and yet he answers my queries. So you know who you are, sir, if you're watching this right now. Thank you for the time you gave me. So I wrote to this person and said, what do you think of Rushfield's analysis? And he wrote back, I pretty much agree with Richard's assessment of where the business in Hollywood is heading. Eventually, there will be five major streaming entities for film and TV content, some of which are almost already set in stone. Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney+, Plus, Apple TV, and YouTube. I believe the rest will be a combination of all the others, minus the ones that will be absorbed by the five aforementioned companies, and these include Peacock, HBO Max, Paramount Plus, and Stars. And what's interesting about that, Peacock is of course NBC Universal, HBO Max is Warner Brothers, Paramount Plus is Paramount Plus, it's Paramount, and Stars is Stars. What people in Hollywood may not see coming is the bursting of the bubble of the content spend of the top streamers after the shakeup occurs and things stabilize with respect to who the survivors are. Right now, these streaming services, and this is very something very important to remember, right now, these streaming services spend the equivalent of 100 to 150% of their streaming revenue on content. This is obviously unsustainable. The streamers eventually want to be spending about 50% of their revenue on overhead, which is essentially the cost of running the business, and then maybe 35-40% to 40 of revenue on content in order to operate at a minimum of 10% profit. Can you imagine what will happen when that content spend drops dramatically? It will be a bloodbath at all of these production companies that have expanded to be able to provide for the streaming companies during their arms race. You might have noticed that I didn't even mention the exhibition business. The streaming companies won't give a hoot about that business, except to the extent that releasing a movie theatrically helps market their movies. On top of all of that, the streaming services for film and TV content are about to feel the effects of the incoming emergence of the gaming streaming services that is growing between Microsoft, Sony, Valve, Epic, and Nintendo. The new generation of consumers will be spending more of their finite free time on game streaming services. Now, I have to say, I got chills just reading that. First of all, thank you so much, sir, for this cogent analysis. And I absolutely believe, I've said on this show many times, I've said motion pictures were the art form of the 20th century. And if you think about it, we didn't even have sound until the late 1920s. Well... 
the 21st century is going to be the art form of the 21st century is going to be gaming. And um, look, as much as I love films, as much as I love narrative, narrative as we have known it will always exist. There will always be books. There will always be plays. There will always be, well, any kind of narrative. And certainly movies and TV aren't going away anytime soon. But as both of the both this gentleman and Richard Rushfield pointed out, that the new generation of people is not married to narrative. The narratives that we've been enjoying are not the narratives they care about. The narratives they care about are Ghost of Tsushima, the remake of Final Fantasy VII, Grand Theft Auto, uh, Red Dead Redemption, or pick God of War, pick your game. Uh, the new generation of people coming up now, they don't care about this kind of narrative. They care about the narratives that are presented long form, Last of Us. They care about long form gaming narratives where those narratives are gonna be just as vibrant as the narratives that we've been watching our whole lives. Now, I'll miss that. I mean, I, I, I'm I, older, I love cinema. I've always loved cinema. It's what I wanted to work in my whole life and I've been doing that. But the future, as is pointed out, let me read this last line in case anyone didn't get this. On top of all that, the streaming services for film and TV content are about to feel the effects of the incoming emergence of the gaming streaming services that is growing between Microsoft, Sony, Valve, Epic, and Nintendo. The new generation of consumers will be spending more of their finite free time on game streaming services. Hollywood needs to understand this because woe to them if they don't. And once again, I want to thank the esteemed gentleman who wrote me this cogent analysis. Again, sir, thank you for your time. Now, I want to go on, and um, we've, I, I, I read Richard Rushfield's article about uh, exhibition, movie theater exhibition. And I've always said that, that movie theaters have one job, and that is to show films in their best possible light. Movie theaters, like the theater-going experience, you know, let's face it, the general public, a lot of them are assholes. They think when they're going to a movie theater that they're, they're basically in their living room. And uh, they don't give a fuck. And I hate those people. I hate people that look at their phones. The whole point about being in a movie theater is to be completely immersed in the dark, where you don't have distractions. There's nothing worse than being in a movie theater where you see someone's light of their phone come on. It's rude. It's horrific. And you know what? If there's something more important in your life that you need to look at your phone during a film, fuck off. Seriously, fuck you. Go home. And you know what? If I turn around in my Clint Eastwood voice and say, if you don't put your phone away, I'm going to slit your throat from ear to ear. Well, let's, I've said that before. People usually get up and walk away. Sometimes I've gotten into a beef. But you know what? If you don't want to hear that, put your goddamn phone away. When you go into a movie theater, it's sacrosanct. It is holy. It's a holy place. There is nothing that's going on in your life unless your wife's about to go into labor or something. Then I'll, then I'll cut you a break. But there's nothing that's more important than the movie that's on the screen. You are not important. more important than the movie that's about to show on the screen. So don't do it. But anyway, that's, that's the least of our problems. The biggest problems is the fact that projection in a lot of these theaters sucks. They want to save money on their bulbs, so they, they dim the bulb. So the image is not bright enough. You've all, you, know, you all know what I'm talking about. The sound sometimes sucks because they don't have union projectionists anymore. So if there's a problem, I mean... We spend a lot of time as filmmakers trying to get our sound mixes right, correct, and when it, when they don't, when they're not, when movies are not projected correctly and they don't sound right, you're doing a disservice to everyone. But the problem is, you know, you you they don't want to spend the money, and they don't have the kind of people that know what they're doing. So Richard Rushfield included this also in uh, in uh, uh, in his newsletter, and I will let me let me get into this. Uh, uh, he says, responses continue to pour in regarding the crumbling of theatrical. Here's one from Ankler Friend and Industry Veteran. And this is interesting, too. As someone who's worked in every sector of the business, I feel like I've gained a certain knowledge. The learning that seems most relevant to this is no one in the film business goes to movie theaters. At least they don't buy tickets. Exhausted claims that I am in a screening room all day or I wouldn't pay when I can see everything for free. Of course, the famous, ugh, I don't even like movies, which I've heard so often is maddening. 
I've heard so often, it's maddening. So to your point about licensing crappy products, how many industries endorse every level of executives saying they don't even use the product? Restaurant executives who refuse to go out to eat, airline executives who refuse to fly, fashion executives who wouldn't be caught dead in clothes, auto executives who don't drive, all are impossible, except in our business, where ignorance of the consumer experience with the product is actively encouraged, even by the academy, that is set up to celebrate and boost the business. In the entirety of the career I laid out above, only one noted executive I work with was known for going to the local cine cinemaplex. It was a weekly occurrence done without fanfare or pomp. I can tell you, I can tell you that at every exhibition level I've worked with had active disdain for going to the movies. I can't even believe that. But it's true. I'll just say that in April of 2020, when movie going shut down, exhibitors had all summer, fall, and winter, and spring to think about how they could change the experience and welcome people back. In May of 2020, I was on calls to encourage thinking about a national campaign to entice people back, and no one wanted to do a thing. The industry is known for years that it's bleeding customers, but it has done nothing. Not a thing. No national campaigns to encourage movie going, no discussion of process improvement. The studios see no point in encouraging exhibition improvement because everyone making $50,000 or more who works for a studio refuses to go to a theater. You're 100% right. They don't know how the movies are being shown. Worse, they don't care. And neither do the chains that own those places. No one really gives a shit anymore. They just want to turn out the content and get their names in the headlines. I just think it's sad. I don't know what it adds up to except that it all just feels enormous, enormously catastrophically awful. Here's something else. And here's another from a theater goer not all that far away. I want to thank you for shining a light on the increasingly decrepit and wholly substandard state of movie theaters. Let me add a few anecdotes to the pile. My wife and I live in an affluent area of the Coachella Valley. It's not Brentwood, but it's not the sticks either. And we've had nearby what would be considered nice, modern, mega-chain redacted facilities. And we love going to the movies. Even so, the experiences at these places is so haphazard and lacking in basic quality control that it feels like there's a colossal tax attached to the experience in discomfort and aggravation. There are frequently sound problems. Either sound so low, it's like listening to a movie through a laptop speaker, or a movie literally starting to roll without sound of any kind, requiring us to retrieve an employee from some distant corner of the building to troubleshoot. On some occasions, the theater is not clean between screenings, Customers are constantly on their phones and or conversing as if they're in their own living room with zero deterrence from mega-chain redacted employees. And there are good three to six advertisements, not trailers, which I enjoy, but actual product commercials that we're required to sit through before each film. Many times I've written to mega-chain redacted about these issues. I've never received a response. It takes a lot for me to not want to go to the movies, but these distributors are working hard to make it happen. So, you know, I've been railing about this same thing for a long period of time. And look, as we get better and better, give me a 77-inch OLED TV and a great surround sound system, uh, meaning Atmos as well, and great speakers. And I have to tell you, I understand there's not a lot of incentive to go to the movies when you can stay home and watch things. And I think that's, unfortunately, the future of the business which I do think is incredibly sad. And again, like my esteemed colleague said in his missive, the idea that gaming channels, movies, uh, are, are, are going by the wayside anyway. And that's just, that's really just the way things are. And while I don't like it, it's not something that I would prefer, it is something that we're going to have to deal with in the future. And uh, it's kind of a bummer. You know, on Midnight Metal, on Friday night with Leal and uh, I read an article that talked about the fact that having a collective experience in a movie theater, an experience together, actually there's a physiological response, dopamine hits, whatever. But there is a physiological response that makes the movie theater business uh, something that shouldn't go away. We actually, going to movies is actually good for your health. And is sitting in a collective uh, uh, experience with 
a b- bunch of strangers, humanity, uh, it's a good thing. And we're letting it go away. Uh, by the way, Terrier says, he's a PGS Hero member of this channel. He says, Milestone Unlocked, I've been a member of this channel for the length of a pregnancy. Oh, and I'm totally pro-choice. So Terrier, thank you for that. By the way, we had a fabulous members call yesterday. We do it bi-weekly. We're going to have one more before the end of the year. Uh, I want to thank everybody for supporting the channel by being members. And I love these membership membership chats. I, I, I really love it. We Ours went on for, I think we were supposed to do it for two hours, and it went on for almost four. Uh, it was great. I love seeing all of you. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. You know what else I appreciate? Your fucking letters, people. Your letters. Uh, your letters. I love your letters. And um, I'm going to read some. That's right. I'm going to read some letters. I got letters from you. Uh, let's see. I've got, I've, got, I've got actually a bunch of letters. So let me look down. and uh, Here's a letter. This one comes from Rob. Who's Rob? Just Rob. Not me. I'm not reading my own letter. You might think, you might think this is my own letter, but it's not. Hi, Rob. I am so frustrated. After following Star Trek from childhood... Since I can remember, I'm now age 54, a good age, sir. Uh, I can't recall how poor it has become. To show how bad Star Trek Discovery is now on Pluto TV service, as no streaming service in the UK wanted to pay for this rubbish. In my opinion, it is Star Trek in name only. Fans are just switching off from the franchise. To this day, I always go back to the original series and the quality stories, even if we had some dud episodes. Even the films, I always had affection for them as it was always clear the writers had an understanding of how the franchise worked and kept its fan base ticking along. The more I watch Star Trek Discovery, it makes no sense at all, abandoning the franchise lore. Could you imagine Tilly on the bridge of Kirk's Enterprise? Never. The Federation now seems to revolve around Michael Burnham. What the fuck? What has happened to any sight of a chain of command? Kirk, Picard, they always knew there would be a consequence if it was broken, But not Star Trek Discovery, just carry on breaking it. It'll be lucky if the Federation continues. Each episode, everyone looks like they're five seconds away from tears. Sorry, correct that. Someone cries every episode. Pluto, in the UK's top show, is Baywatch. Which was so bad it was almost good. Star Trek Discovery is just bad. And there's no redemption for it. It has to end, surely? What fate is awaiting Picard Season 2? I get a feeling that it would be one with crying. Then we'll have to be... Oh, then we have Waiting in the Wings, Strange New Worlds. And you can see that Pike is going to be weak and put in his place. And at some point, a young Kirk will show up with issues that will show him as damaged, then deconstructed before he becomes captain. At what point do we stop watching? I suppose if streamers are pulling the plug, then the message may get through. I think they've pushed away the original fan base for the sake of ideology and a complete lack of understanding of what built this franchise. Rant over. Wishing you all the best and continued support for your channels. That comes from Rob. Rob, well, you know that you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay, and no, I did not write that article to myself. Much as if I did, I would would certainly take credit for it. Uh, This next letter comes to us from John D. Rob, longtime supporter of your YouTube work. I was watching Rob's observations on day one. I've just been so busy with work and teaching and getting students ready for finals, etc. So I need you to help me out with something, please. Uh, John Campia has thrown you repeatedly under the bus. By emphatically stating at least three or four times, probably even more, but I lose count, that when he decided to change the show format, you originally understood and even committed to driving there two and three times a week to participate in the studio. But you went back on your word and left him hanging, and he was not happy about it. Rob, I don't want to call him a liar. I just don't see you as that kind of guy. Now, hold on. He's not entirely wrong. John Campia is nothing if not a stand-up guy. And while when he first told me about this, I did say, okay, you know, I really, because he, he, he didn't call me up. He, he, it was already done. You know, he already made this decision. He didn't call me up and say, I was thinking about this. What here? And I'm like, uh, okay, yeah. And, and I was thinking about it, but I, you know, he just told me. 
So I, I listened to him. I'm like, uh-huh. You know, I was just, uh, yep, yep, yep. Okay. Okay. So I did, I did say that, but I hadn't really, a- after I thought about it, I'm like, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. Now, let me also say one thing. He's never actually asked me to come back on the show. He's never actually said to me, the only thing he's asked me to do, he called me up and he said, hey, we're, I'm doing a Spider-Man screening. Do you want to come to that? I said, yeah, totally. John Campy is a good guy. Now, you know, there are, all, there are people that are always calling me and telling me that you should go back on the show and, and all this, and I respect that, but it is, it is a pain in the ass. I would have to drive. It's a two-hour round trip, at least, minimum of two hours. For a ninety-minute show, I just I can't I can't do that, you know. It doesn't make any sense for me. I've got too much other I, I've got too many other shows I'm working on, too many other projects. So uh, let me just finish the let me just finish the letter. Rob, I don't want to call him a liar, but I don't see you as that kind of guy. I see you as a man who, when he gives his word on something, you stand by it no matter what. It's what we all love about you. So why except the people, <laughs> the film festival? So why does he repeatedly tell his audience that you lied to him? Why does he say that uh, and the audience and went back on your word? Please help me out here. Uh, I don't have Twitter or Instagram or even Facebook, so forgive me if you posted this response somewhere else, but I wouldn't have been able to see if you had. I 100% believe that if you have, you had, it, I 100% believe that if you had given your word to commit to driving there, you'd have done it, not turn around the next day and break your word. I wanted to give this chance to you to express your thoughts. P.S. The whole business of the new format, getting back to pre-COVID standards of having only in-studio guests, guests is total BS. Just one example, I recall a show that we only got for a few weeks, but didn't Kristen Harloff appear on a few episodes of Dark Side, Like Side via Skype? I'm sure there were others, but this definitely happened before COVID. John D. Well, first of all, I have to say, I did used to go to do it in studio. And I, were, when John lived in Burbank, I was 15 minutes away from him. And I did the show from his... Um, house. And that's how we did it. And I understand. I, I really do. I mean, I like doing it better uh, in the studio, you know, with him. I like that energy. And that's what John's after. You know, he's after that kind of energy. And um, I, 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 you know, at first it seemed, I have to say, I did indicate that, yeah, yeah, it sounds good to me. But since we had that conversation, you know, I had said, I, you know, I don't know. And I, I, I didn't really like, we didn't like John doesn't consult me when he's going to change the show. He just tells me after the fact, like we're going to be at we're, the show's going to be at 11 now. Okay. Then his viewership dropped. He says, we're going to go back to 10. I'm like, okay. You know, but he doesn't consult with me on those changes. He just tells me after he's made up his mind. And then I get it. I understand like being in the, in the, in the, in the, in the studio is fine, but I don't think that for me, a two hour drive, it's one, it's 15 minutes one way or the other was one thing. And I would do that. And I liked that. I liked going to John's house. But two hours, it was it, it just too much. You know, and I, I started thinking about it. But we never had a real, like, if, if the fault, if there was any fault there, it would be my fault. Because I should have called John up and said, after we had this conversation, you know, I've been thinking about it and I can't do it. I can't, I can't do this, this, this thing. And then we, we did have a conversation about that. And I told him, but, but, he never did ask me to come back on the show. Like he didn't say, "Hey, uh, need you on the, need you in the show on t- need you in the studio Tuesday." And I said, "Sorry, can't come." <laughs> you know that that never happened. But I I I just do think that um, I mean I like doing the show better in the studio as well. So John's not wrong about that. But anyway, John D, I want to thank thank you for writing in. Thanks for your support. Appreciate that. But I hope that clears everything up. Uh, this comes from. Jason Webster. Hi, Rob. I hope yourself and the fabulously engaging members of the Post Geek Singularity have experienced a wonderful weekend and feel energized and are in supreme form to tackle a new week. I want to take this opportunity to review a wonderful K-drama released last year entitled Lie After Lie. Directed by Kim Jung Kwong, who made Ditto, Lie After Lie is a compelling K-drama about a woman, uh, Jiun Soo, the daughter-in-law of a well-known uh, Shibol family who served a prison sentence for the murder of her domestically abusive husband, a crime she did not commit. Upon her release after serving six years, the trauma she suffered from her abusive husband in prison steals her to seek revenge against her mother-in-law, Kim Ho Ran, who orchestrated her unjust incarceration despite knowing her son was guilty of domestic violence. 
Produced by Kim Dong Rae, Lie After Lie premiered on Channel A on 4th of September of 2020. Its original broadcast run consisted of 16 episodes and finished its one season run on October 24th. The acting in the series is top tier, especially from lead actress Lee Yu Ri as Isun. The level of storytelling and acting engages the audience, eliciting sympathy and compassion for Isun's experiences. We cheer her on to overcome her malevolent mother in law and find the happiness she truly deserves. I've enjoyed watching Lee Yu Ri's performance in numerous films and K dramas over the years since I first saw the K horror film Bushin Saba. The pacing of the series is smooth and no scene lingers unnecessarily. Lie After Lie was a critical and commercial success, achieving a nationwide average rating of 4.35%, making the series one of the highest rated K-dramas in cable television history. Lie After Lie steadily and consistently raised its viewership over the course of the series, always a sure sign the series is working. The finale achieved a rating of 8.2%, the peak for the series and allowing the series to smash its own record. Lie After Lie holds a rating of 7.5 out of 10 on IMDb and 8.3 out of 10 on MyDramaList.com. Lie After Lie is a great drama and ranks alongside Missing You, Heartless City, Secret, and It's Okay Not to Be Okay, Vincenzo, and My Name as one of the best. The series draws you in and doesn't let go until the final scene and no narrative thread overstays its welcome as all good shows do. It quickly became one of my favorites. I recommend this series to anyone, irrespective of whether they are longtime viewers of K-dramas or novices. I hope yourself and your esteemed moderators and the great members of the PGS have a wonderful start to the week. Sincerely, Jason Webster. Well, Jason, I always appreciate your reviews. I like that one. That was that was manageable. It wasn't too terrible. I hope I didn't butcher too many names. But thanks for that one. Uh, this one comes from Jake Bennett. Hello, Rob, and greetings from the UK. I've been giving some thought to Khan in Space Seed and in the movie Wrath of Khan. He does strike me as villainous in my mind when I've pondered him on wanting the Genesis device. The man tried to take over the Enterprise and was allowed to go to SETI Alpha 5. Despite seeing Wrath of Khan a few times, great movie that started my road into Star Trek, but my love really began thanks to the David Mack Mirror Universe novels, but I digress. By the way, shout out to Mr. David Mack for his Star Trek Coda, the third volume in the Coda series that came out last week. My God, what a barn burner of a book. Uh, everything you've ever wanted in a Star Trek story, uh, his third book co of, of the Coda series, uh, Oblivion's Gate, is... Um, I, I I kid you not. There is no stone unturned. Uh, you want a Borg queen? You got her. You want the Mirror Universe? Yes. You want Captain Riker going a little bit nuts and turning into Ahab trying to hunt down and murder Picard? Hey, there's that too. I won't get into why or how. You get a shut up, Wesley. I'm telling you, this book has everything. The Coda series has been monumentally fun. I like to think of it as Crisis on Infinite Star Trek Universes. And uh, it's great villains. It's a lot of fun. Um, despite seeing Wrath of Khan a few times, great movie that started my road into Star Trek, but my love really began thanks to the David Mack Mirror Universe novels, but I digress. My memory is sketchy on this, but I wonder what Khan's reason is for getting the Genesis device. It's never said he wanted to take over the Federation at all. He doesn't care about that. I have a feeling that he only wanted to restore SETI Alpha 5, despite what we learn in Search for Spock. That's actually, that's actually really interesting. He seemed pretty content to have a planet that was his home. The only thing that made him an antagonist, you said Star Trek didn't have villains, it had antagonists. It's true. That is true. Was that he wanted Kirk to suffer the way he did. Kirk didn't check up on Khan, and the latter essentially watched helplessly as half his community and his wife died in front of his eyes. Yes, he was a conqueror who, were, he, who ruled the quarter of the earth, but he certainly isn't above caring for his own. Even Joaquin said when Khan wanted to go after Kirk, you have Genesis. You can go wherever you want. Do whatever you want. Khan had the means of rebuilding his empire and his revenge and let it, uh, and revenge let it slip through his fingers. It's amazing when you can look back on a character and gain new insight or have new perspective on them. What are your thoughts on Khan himself? Well, Jake, what a great letter. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, look, I think the Genesis device was, was something that, that was an opportunity that was presented to Khan because he wasn't expecting it. You know, he was stuck on SETI Alpha 5. The Reliant comes along. And uh, Captain Terrell and Chekhov beam down, and Khan's like, well, we have a way off this rock, and they just happen to have Genesis. So I don't think Khan wanted to take over, and I don't necessarily think he was even thinking about revenge against Kirk. 
uh, I've never even met Admiral Kirk. Admiral Kirk. I mean, he didn't. He wasn't necessarily. I don't think that was on his agenda. He didn't have much of an agenda. He wanted to get the fuck off that planet. And um, but then, yes, he was consumed with the idea of revenge once the opportunity was presented to him. Because, I mean, let's face it. I don't know where these flies are coming from. It's so weird. There's never flies in here. Um, uh, it was a. It sucked. I mean, he he did watch. It. He he was, and it's funny. I mean, he could have used the Genesis device to to transform SETI Alpha Five. That would have been interesting. That was probably something Nicholas Meyer thought about, but um, they didn't get that far. <laughs> you know, it was Khan's like, wait a minute, I can revenge myself upon Kirk, Admiral Kirk. So. Ron C., member of uh, the Imagination Connoisseur, uh, member of the channel. He's an Imagination Connoisseur for 11 months. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think, look, Khan is a tragic figure. He, in the original Space Seed, Spock says superior ability breeds, breeds superior ambition. And Khan was, let's face it, I mean, he was a genetically engineered tyrant, um, but he was not some despot, you know, uh, 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 even even Scotty said, I've always had a sneaking admiration for this one because apparently he was good at what he did and uh, people didn't suffer under his regime. So, um, hey, uh, Space Seed, you know, I I, I saw on, on um, I was reading on Facebook on one of the groups I belong to. Somebody said, well, I started a TOS rewatch and the show is just, it's so cheesy and misogynistic and Space Seed's not a very good episode. Only because of Wrath of... I'm like, fuck off. Space Seed's a great episode. It's a great episode of Star Trek because it presents... It, it, it has a lot of really interesting ideas. Ricardo Montalban kills it in that episode. And I'm tired of people going back and watching the original series and going, well, you know, it really doesn't hold up. I mean, it doesn't hold up. No, you don't hold up. The show's 55 years old. It doesn't have to hold up for you because it's already been... History has already judged Star Trek. And um, I don't need your opinion about it. I already know it's great. It's always been great. And if you go back and you're going to rewatch it now and talk about, well, there's misogyny and sexism. Well, you know what? Back in the day, the mid '60s, uh, life was a little different. You got to, you got to, you got to uh, allow for that. And after all, westerns were all the big rage on TV. And Roddenberry said it is a wagon train to the stars. And if you go back and you watch a first season episode like Mud's Women, that's a western. That's that's uh, that's a western tale. You know, there's a guy bringing brides to miners out in the out in the outback, <laughs> out in the old west. I mean, that is a complete throwback to a western storyline. Now, could you say that's a misogynistic um, episode, perhaps? But you also that episode's really interesting. It really is about people finding inner beauty, thinking they need something to help them be beautiful, and really they don't. Great episode, even though it's you know early on, and and I would say it's a great episode. It's not a great Star Trek episode per se, but but really when you think back about what it has to say, it is pretty great if you think about it. You know, it was the first Harry Mudd episode. So, hey, there you go. Uh, you don't have to agree with me. Uh, you don't. So, um, what, what, what are you going to do? Uh, let's see. This one comes from William LaRochelle. R&B and moderators of the Post Geek Singularity course correction matters. We all have our pet fantasy about bad choices of content creators being walked back or erased or reclassified as legends to say that one made-up story iteration is now less than another fiction. I am in the camp that saw Ghostbusters Afterlife opening day. Pretty much got a build-up to the ending I expected, and I'm happy with it. I'm perhaps even happier that it serves as a course correction after the 2016 movie that you say wasn't the dumpster fire it is said to be. There are plenty of misguided, bloated movies that have a few laughs or a few kernels of corn in the... Oh, never mind. I did not pay attention to the notorious 2016 iteration. Since it was not in continuity with the 80s films, that was a deal breaker in this case more than any other factor. I received a link to a bootleg and streamed it for free. A few months later, I borrowed a DVD from a local library just to hear the commentary track. This would have been just before Mr. Plinkett's review pointed out that Paul Feig saying he had to pay royalties for a bit of a song Kate McKinnon improvised, and he thought it was from some Disney movie. It was from The Wizard of Oz. I can take or leave Red Letter Media. 
They may be funny, but I unsubscribed from them a few years back when a review I don't remember felt like they had crossed a line into a pathology. Best of the worst feels like that mentality fits, but I typically avoid it. Strange that Mike Staklasa now claims he is sick of the discourse around Ghostbusters 2016, considering how many videos Red Letter Media fed into that. It might be amusing to see them use the footage from Ray's dream about a female ghost giving him a favor as a background for their collection of carefully chosen dumb guy positive comments about the new movie, including any misspelling of Ramus they could find. There, they take a page from the old Sony playbook where comments under the 2016 trailer were curated so that reasonable remarks were omitted, leaving only the most childish or profane to stand as representing any dissenting view of the coming remake. Some YouTubers kept the receipts, as they say. I can't imagine sitting there doing frame grabs, but people did it. When you say that Ghostbusters Afterlife is guilty of relying on nostalgia, fan service, or callbacks, I would argue that it is a world. Egon had the Ecto-1 in storage. We know he eats Twinkies, so there might be one in the glove compartment, still edible or not. I can take or leave the Slimer-like mental-eating ghost, though I would have preferred to be a different color so we know he is not Slimer. This is the 2016 version that is using callbacks as marketing gimmicks and playing on Epney nostalgia. For the logo, the car, the song, the trappings, things Feig considered to be the baby and not the bathwater. You consider it a plus that it was set in New York, but it was mostly shot in Boston. Most significantly, there is no way now to wrest the movies themselves from the discourse. Sony, the director and cast, with complicity from fellow talk show hosts and critics who brought in, bought into the false conflation of legacy Ghostbusters fans with Trump supporters, were ultimately a team of millionaires punching down at what they considered a vocal minority of incels, 40-year-old mother's basement dwellers, neck-bearded trolls, and maybe other invictives that emerged around the time. Mark Kermode belongs in that generalization. I used, to listen to, I used to listen to anything about cinema, but he's been saying that anyone who uses the term woke as a pejorative he will disregard, so it is fair to click the do not recommend on YouTube as a gesture of time management. A Nightmare on Elm Street had its ill-conceived remake, and there are some of us who would like to see Robert England return for one more Freddy movie to reclaim the role. There was a remake of Evil Dead, which made no impression on me one way or another, but then we got the series Ash vs. Evil Dead, which was the bonus we didn't even expect. You mentioned Cobra Kai, which is indeed very refreshing and legitimate. We'll see if they use the Hillary Swank character from The New Karate Kid. Interesting that Will Smith is a producer on Cobra Kai, but wise that they had no inclination to address the 2010 Jackie Chan version of Mr. Miyagi, Mr. Han. It paints over it like Daniel paints the fence. Luckily, a lot of people seem to like Egon's granddaughter, Phoebe. Paul Rudd works as a representative of the fan base on screen and the director's attitude toward that fan base. In Feig's Folly, that role of stand-in for the built-in fan base would have been a guy named Noel Casey of Lower Decks who played the schlub villain Rowan North. In fairness, Casey has been on some decent shows since then. The only good thing that has come from the Paul Feig remake of Ghostbusters was that it made Ghostbusters 2 look less weak. It is falsely credited with showing that Chris Hemsworth can do comedy, but I would give that credit to the underappreciated in-continuity vacation sequel of 2015. With Ghostbusters, I would absolutely watch a streaming series called Ray's Occult, where each week he has to advise another creepy customer in his bookshop. Just Ray, and maybe once in a while, he has a coffee with Winston. Since Ramus died, there was no way that the surviving senior citizens from the legacy cast could approach a follow-up with the irreverence of their younger selves. Even though Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin have a certain tone and patter on their Netflix series, and the plan to bring in Dolly Parton for the final season of that is likely going to be more satisfying for their hardcore fans than a 9-to-5 sequel in the modern day. I don't know where I would want an afterlife sequel to go, to be honest. Would Phoebe go to school in the city to breeze through a degree? Would it be the same place the OG Ghostbusters were thrown out of? Would we find out who her grandmother was? Because maybe I missed something, but I don't know who Callie was left with when Egon took off to fight evil. Some people were upset that it wasn't Janine, who keeps her last name and was not even married to, say, Louis Tully. I was happy she showed up, but the question of who married Egon might make for a fun fan casting. Maybe Gene Smart, who was so entertaining in The Watchmen. But the brand and the fandom are undoubtedly in a better place than they were in 2016. If Leslie Jones is upset, at least she got away with raping Eddie Murphy in Amazon's Coming to America.
with a shocking lack of internet blowback for that. Never mind Wonder Woman seeing only Steve Trevor while she sleeps with his host. That, oddly, I saw lots of complaints about, even though it could be argued that Wonder Woman has automatic consent. By the way, a lot of people dislike Wonder Woman 84, but having recently seen it and knowing wishes were a key plot point, I got over that and actually found it fun. Live long and prosper, William. P.S. The claim benchmark of progress for Ghostbusters Answer the Call, or Bad Call of Paul, is the introduction of women as scientists. For your consideration, here are some that predate that. Kate Reed in The Andromeda Strain is one example, funny and grounded. Beatrice Strait as Dr. Lesh in Poltergeist. Jane Addams serving the same function by another name as Dr. Brooke Powell. Vera Farmiga had already played Lorraine Warren in The Conjuring 1 and 2 by the time Ghostbusters 2016 came out and continues to play her across a few related brands. It might be an interesting exercise to list others, but I've taken up your time on this myself. Some say the underperformance of Ghostbusters 2016 was because fans don't think women are funny. Yet Bad Moms that year was funny, made five times its budget, and earned a sequel. Girl Trip, which I haven't seen, made money that year too. And even consider the cast. By 2016, I was still a fan of Cicely Strong from SNL, who appears in the film. Melissa McCarthy has had been good in dramas, but some people like her farting, endomorph body type, fall down style of comedy. Kristen Wiig is very funny in Paul and in Paul and in MacGruber. Kate McKinnon is funny on SNL, and her bizarre interjections were among the few things I liked in The Misfire. Leslie Jones has a couple of skits where she fits, including the grumpy technician in Undercover Boss, Starkiller Base. The oldest of that main cast, Jones, was 50 at the time. Interesting that a movie that crowed about plans to kick off a few movies had two of four well-placed into their 40s. If Afterlife does have a future, at least it's wide open with young Phoebe. Better business plan anyway, if only they had some proton packs for Christmas this year. Uh, what an interesting letter you, you've written. Uh, thanks for that, William. Um, yeah, that was, I, you know, I mean, I didn't, I was reading an article about Ghostbusters and, and the nostalgia in it. I think Ghostbusters Afterlife was more about the audience than it was necessarily about the film. Uh, it was a fine sequel. I think there was a lot in it that was enjoyable. Um, I just, you know, it, it, to me, I, I looked at things, really what it said to me was, <laughs> Ghostbusters was a movie, somebody, somebody, um, made a comment on one of my stream, actually on the, on the actual observations in question, somebody wrote something that I thought was really interesting and, and spot on. And it was simple to the point they wrote that Ghostbusters it's strange that Ghostbusters Afterlife is a reverential movie about a movie that was about irreverence. And I was like, you know what? That's exactly right. And I, I find that, that that's, I guess that's my whole problem. I'm just wondering, where is all of our new entertainment? Where are the new things that people are going to fall in love with that'll be here in the future? Uh, where's the new Ghostbusters and I don't mean a sequel or another Ghostbusters movie. I mean, where's another movie like a Ghostbusters? Where is a Back to the Future? Where is a Jaws? You know, where is Alien? And I'm not talking about iterations of those films. I'm talking about the, the new, brand new movies that no one's ever seen before. And I don't know if our entertainment business is ever going to be able to ever be able to provide those to us again. I mean, there's been some great stuff. I've seen great things on Netflix. I mean, I keep going back to um, The Queen's Gambit which is a literary adaptation I thought was fantastic. There's been a lot of great stuff. Um, there's been shows like Dark on Netflix uh, that I love. Squid Game, of course, is something that maybe is going to stand the test of time. But I wonder where are the movies, and, and will there ever be a movie? You know, I, I again, I, I, I firmly believe that our future, the future of um, entertainment is going to be in gaming. Virtual gaming, video gaming, call it what you will. And I'm firmly uh, of the belief that sometime in the latter part of the 2020s, we are going to have a revolution the same way that sound revolutionized movies at the end of the 1920s. I think there's going to be a technological revolution, assuming that we don't blow ourselves up or anything like that. But there will be a technological revolution in gaming, virtual reality, whatever, call it what you will. I mean, Facebook's already trying to build its own metaverse. 
if we're going to get a Neil Stevenson type future and we're all going to live on the street, if you've read Snow Crash, um, I think that's going to happen by the end of this decade. I don't know what that's going to look like, but it's certainly going to change uh, entertainment forever. And I don't know if uh, there will ever be movies like there are or like there were in the 80s and 70s and 90s. I don't know. And if there aren't, maybe that's just the way of things. As much as I love narrative, as much as I love two-hour movies, and I, I'd like to make, you know, I'd like to make four more movies. I like, I've only directed, written, and directed one movie in my life. I'd like to make four more. I don't know why, you know. I, I'd like to make four more films in my life that I've directed, so I at least have an oeuvre. I can be like, okay, that was my life. My life. I wanted to make movies. I have five movies to show for it, um, and hopefully, I can do that. And then people can look back and go, that was what Rob Burnett was all about, right there. Shh. But I don't know if we're going to live in that world. I think the uh, that window's closing. We shall see. Anyway, I want to um, I want to uh, um, thank you for that letter. This next one comes from Darren Prescott, not the stuntman, and he writes in cancellation of James Bond gathering momentum. Hi everyone. I'm not sure if you saw this article. It's a week old now. If not, I think you'll find it interesting. Let's jump in. This comes from The Mirror in the UK. And uh, <laughs> this letter, this comes from Tom Bryant. It was published on November 26th. Exclusive, Freddie Flintoff says Roger Moore looked like a creepy old bloke as James Bond. I don't know who Freddie Flintoff is. Hang on, let me look into it before I read this article. Uh, Freddie Flintoff, what does it say? Uh, oop, I don't know. Who is Freddie Flintoff? Um, uh, I'm not really sure. <laughs> is he a soccer player? Hang on, let me let me find out. I want to know uh, because uh, yeah, Freddie, Freddie, Freddie Flintoff. Uh, let's see who he is. I don't know who he is. Uh, Andrew Freddie Flintoff, MBE, is an English television and radio presenter and former international cricketer. And he has a very, very attractive wife. So good for you, Freddie, Freddie Flintoff. Freddie Flintoff says, Freddie Flintoff has described Roger Moore's version of James Bond as a creepy old bloke you'd warn your daughter about. Oh, the Top Gear star said he's had a rethink about the spy after watching the old movies again and realizing how out of date the character was. The 43-year-old said, People I thought were heroes of the silver screen when I was growing up, I'm not so sure now. I've been watching the old James Bond movies all the way through to the more recent Daniel Craig films. I watched Casino Royale, and you believe Craig could do something in a fight. He looks capable. He looks quite hard and the type of bloke a woman might fancy. I've realized I don't really like James Bond, but then I think sometimes I rebel against popular things for absolutely no reason. The TV star went on, but here's the reason I've had a rethink. It hit me when I was watching the movies from the 1970s that this was a creepy old bloke who you'd warn your daughter about. I watched one, Roger Moore in Octopussy. He's on this bed with an aquarium in the background and a girl in her mid-twenties. He must be 50-odd with his hairy back and he's getting on to mount her, giving a little wink to the camera like everyone's in on it and it's all right. I was taken aback by how out of date it was and how I reacted. How can anybody defend that now? It wasn't on. Then he's fighting with someone who he's completely out of his depth with. Depth with. Jaws would have ripped him apart limb by limb. It's total nonsense. <laughs> well, <laughs> Freddie, uh, I, I, I have to tell you that you'd probably feel that way about most of the movies that were made before, uh, well, the 1990s. I don't know what to say. I mean, Roger Moore did play Bond into his 50s. And um, what can you say? I, I disagree. <laughs> I don't think you're I don't think you're correct, sir. Uh I just don't. Freddie Flintoff. Uh uh Aiken in the chat says he's a twat. He is a twat for saying that. I mean, you know, it's so weird to me. Can I just say one of my one of my pet peeves in life is that people go back and they look at the past and they expect they're like, well, this is problematic from our perspective. Yeah, all of human history is. <laughs> I mean, like, where do you want, how far back do you want to go? You know, uh, 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 how far back do you want to pillory people? Um, and it seems like, what, we can only go back, like, what, 10 years now before people have problematic behavior? Human beings, over the course of 
the decades, the centuries, the millennia we've lived here, we've not been a great bunch of folks. It's amazing we're still here. Um, but this idea that you're going to go back and, well, I don't like the fact that, look, you want to look at uh, how many old men married young women over the course of history? I mean, this is, yeah, we weren't all enlightened, we weren't all engaged, but this idea that you're going to go back and pillory every single human being for not being woke or not being in the past, <laughs> I, got, I, got, I, I got news for you. Human history ain't so pretty. You know, you want to go back and punish people for things? I mean, I think it's always interesting when people talk about, like, say, slavery. That slavery was something that was invented by North Americans. I mean, human beings have enslaved other human beings since the dawn of time. We're still doing it right now. We have a horrible legacy. As a matter of fact, one of the one of the things that America, that nobody ever talks about, is we actually took a, a policy of slavery and we took a stand against it. For thousands of years, human beings took slaves, but not many times did a country actually stand up and go, no, we will put a stop to this. This is wrong. That was that was actually an improvement. It had never happened before. And slavery is an abhorrent practice, and it, it happened in many different cultures throughout human history. Terrible, terrible, terrible. But somebody had to get up and say, fuck no. Emancipation Proclamation. America did that. I mean, nowadays, people don't remember that, but we did. You know, the country did. Abraham Lincoln did. The Republicans did. Democrats didn't want to, but the Republicans did. And um, that's pretty cool. But human history is is a, it's just one litany of horrible shit that we've done to other people. I mean, human beings are terrible. Terrible. We're terrible. We're awful. But how far back do you want to go? You want to you make fun of James Bond? There's a lot of horrible things. James Bond's the least of your worries. Roger Moore, he didn't start in his 50s, octopussy, admittedly. He was looking a little long in the tooth. I think he was 55 when he made View to a Kill, his last film, which means he'd been playing Bond for quite some time. And um, he was in his early 30s when he played Live and Let Die, you know. Or no, he wasn't in his early 30s. He was in his early 40s when he made Live and Let Die. So, yeah, you're probably right. I mean, it might look creepy to you, but dude, come on. Human history sucks. <laughs> it's just you're going to give you're going to you're going to get you're going to get mad at, at at Roger Moore for playing James Bond. Come on now. <laughs> Some people I Roger Moore is not my favorite Bond, but he was the first Bond. He's the first Bond I ever saw in the theater and Spy Love Me is a fucking great movie. So, it's a great Bond film and it's a great Roger Moore movie. So, why do you gotta, why do you got to be that way? I mean, you don't have to be that way. Do you? Uh, this one comes from Martino Simoni, one of my patron saints. I love Martino Simoni. He's been more generous than uh, I deserve. Uh, Martino says, hey, Robert Burnett. I think I already read this, but I'm going to read it again. Uh, Yesterday I was visiting a construction site near the Golden Eye Dam. And I did a small detour to capture a couple of pics. Unfortunately, it was a foggy day. Oh, he sent me this clip. I don't know where the, um, I don't know where that clip is. That's why I sta- saved this. I don't know where the clip is. I need to find it. Martino, where is that clip? Um, I need to find it. I don't know where it is. Um, what can I do? Uh, well, I guess that's it. Do I have any more letters? I think I've got them all. Maybe there's more. I don't know. Let's uh, let's jump out. Let's jump back to what you guys are saying. What are you saying? I don't know. We're going to find out. What are you saying over there in the live chat? Uh, let's go all the way back. Um, Alex Cruz sends in a super chat and says, Hey, Rob, I think it was a mistake to delete last week's Midnight Metal, but I understand why you did it. <laughs> Very enlightening stuff. Yeah, it was pretty enlightening. But, you know, Dave and I have known each other for a long time. Sometimes airing your dirty laundry, eh. Sometimes it's good to get it. Get rid of it. <laughs> Jason S. By the way, that show is it, it doesn't even exist. I I I've eighty sixed it from the the space time continuum. It's gone, gone. Um, <laughs> thank you, Brian Hepburn, moderating. This is why I have moderators. H D says X Y Z. Man, the best girls in the world. It's so weird when you get spammed by porn. Like really, people don't you, they don't know that there's porn on the internet. Jason S. <laughs> Jason S. says, Breaking news. An elf in Santa's workshop has the Omicron variant 
As confirmed by Santa Claus, the Biden White House has announced they're indefinitely suspending all flights from the North Pole until the Grinch can figure out what the hell's going on. I see what you did there, Jason. Uh, That's kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, look, we don't know. The Omicron variant's new. We'll see what happens. I'm going to get my Moderna booster shot. (laughs) So uh, what can we say? Um, I don't know. uh, Sean's World sends in a super chat and says, you do good work. Keep it up. Thank you, Sean. I try. And uh, girls have been saying that my whole life. Keep it up. Uh, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Try to do the good work. Jeff Yerke is here, the man who gave me a lower third for the Hollywood half and half. Now, here's the thing, guys. I'm just still. I'm. I'm going back. I'm doing the Hollywood half and half. I just don't know if I'm going to do it for very long. I. I. It hasn't really caught on. It's okay, you know. But it, for for the amount of time and effort it takes, it's a lot of work actually to do that show, and it's it's actually kind of tough. If I had a producer that was shooting, that was um, I could concentrate. It's really hard because I have to do all the pictures and stories and it's hard it's a hard thing to do uh don't know if i'll keep doing it i don't know if people dig it enough but jeff yerke who did the lower third thank you sir says happy sunday rmb mrs y sends her love and rockets i love that um people moving out people moving in why because uh, anyway that's actually not a real original love and rocket song that's a remake Haunted When the Minutes Drags, a real love and rocket song. So there you go. Uh, happy Sunday, R&B. Mrs. Y sends her love. Well, I send love to Mrs. Yerke. I mean, as I said, you're the most romantic couple. You're not the official couple of the Burnett work. That's Claude and Candida. But you're all obviously the most in love because you don't go anywhere without your wife or even mentioning her. So let's hear it for Mr. Jeff Yerke. Uh, Mrs. Y sends her love and rockets the Yerkman. P.S. It's Expanse Week. It's Expanse Week. Beltalona. Uh I dude dude, I watched that that there's the clip online of of Anaros' speech. That shit's dope. I can't wait. Cannot wait. Can't wait for the expense. By the way, Lost in Space, the third season of Lost in Space is quite good. I'm sorry to see that show go. Kind of a bummer. Uh R-n, the lovely R-n, Um by the way, uh I I got to meet if only over chat, uh, the lovely Rm's mother. What a delightful woman. I hope she's doing well. And I would say that um, I'm a big fan of her daughter, Rm, as you know. So thank you for that. Rr. 200 Watt Studio sends in a super chat and says, I canceled my Paramount Plus on Amazon subscription, which expires next week. I went ahead and watched the latest Discovery episode. Ugh. Burnham leaves her ship in bookship. I can't. I can't even, uh, first of all, I, I have to say, I have to say, I watched Star Trek Discovery and I'm like, what, who, I mean, I know we're four seasons in, (laughs) but I watched this show and I'm like, have you, have you ever, as anyone who's watching this show, have you ever watched science fiction, any quasi military organization, have you watched aliens, you know, anything, have you read a science fiction novel? I can't. It, 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 it's it, it it's maddening to watch that show. I honestly believe that Star Trek Discovery, and we're talking, I mean, I always say Manimal and Auto Man and Lex, even though Lex is far more enjoyable than Star Trek Discovery. Star Trek Discovery is the worst science fiction TV show ever put on television. It, it, uh, it Hey, they spend a lot of money. You know, it looks beautiful. The actors are actually, the actors are great. They're being completely squandered. I can't believe, you know, I, it's 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 incredible. And Will Wheaton said that the only people that hate Star Trek Discovery are uh, white middle-aged cis males. You know, he tweeted that out. I'm like, Will, you know, I've interviewed you. I've sat down with you for a long, long time, and we've talked. Uh, no, I'll tell you something. The reason I hate Star Trek Discovery is it's a horribly written television show. It is terrible. And it, it, it is, the, it, it, it doesn't, it, 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 I can't even, I just, and you all know, I don't have to go on, but yeah, it's just amazing. And I have to say, I don't think, I mean, I keep going back and watching it. I'm just like, I would rather watch, I found, I found this guy on YouTube, the nitpicking nerd. And he, he, 
you listen to him, he's got this amazing accent. Like, I don't know if he's from Spain or I don't know where he's from. I love his accent. I thought it was like a put on at first. It's not. He's actually got a lot of salient, cogent points to make. But, you know, it, it's interesting. Like, some people get mad that he calls out the actor, the actor that plays Gray, who has a, not, a, a bad, bad acne. And it, it's really distracting. And I don't think, I feel bad for the actor that they don't use CG to smooth uh, his face, their their face. I, 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 I'm not really clear <laughs> about all of this. And I don't think when nitpicking nerd, I don't think he's being, he's trying to be mean, but he's just like, look, this is, this is really distracting and it's not, it doesn't do anybody any favors. And, um, I feel bad watching that and nitpicking nerds are on people like you shouldn't watch him. He's, he attacks people personally. I'm like, well, I mean, you know, the, the, the producers of the show have decided what they're going to show human beings like us. And so if somebody's like, pointing something out that we all might think that, well, that's not, a, it's not really fair. It's more like a personal attack. But then again, when you're watching the TV show and it's, when you're watching the show and it sticks out like a sore thumb, it's, it's a little hard to, it's, 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 it's distracting, but I do like nitpicking nerd and, um, maybe I, I will never watch an episode of discovery. I, I, I will tune into Picard because there's things in it that I like, but I mean, yeah, uh, that, I, that at least, I enjoy. Um, Chris C. Oh, man. Okay. Well, hang on. I got to I got to So Ron C. sends in a super chat and says, Hello there, Rob. I went to a friend's house to watch the Matrix trilogy. He has a big screen and great speakers. However, he has two kids the age of four and five. The kitchen is next to it. It drove me nuts. I believe theaters will stay. <laughs> I hope theaters will stay. Uh, Chris C. Okay. Since Chris, I don't know... If you saw the other day, so Chris C, Chris C viewer, I don't necessarily, you know, I don't know if we've ever met in a meat space, but Chris C, uh, he sent me something. He sent me this. What is this, you might ask? Well, I have a third party figure of um, Carl Urban as Judge Dredd. Well, they made a Judge Anderson, which I didn't even know until later. Chris C just out of the blue sent me this figure. Uh, and I let's see where did I, I put I thought I put his letter here. Where did it go? Well I had it. He sent me a letter, but um, this is it. He sent me a Judge Anderson figure that's gonna go well it's hard to I won't open it up, but it it it, it fits with Carl Urban. So uh, Chris if uh, I forgot to tell you today, you're the fucking man. So thank you very much. Chris C. sends in a super chat and says, Watching your observations while opening my XO6 Picard and Data. It's a good day. For those of you who don't know, XO6 is the company. All they do is make Star Trek action figures. They just announced, of course, I showed it on uh, Fully Articulated. Their next release is Mirror Spock. They've done Data and Picard from First Contact. Those are their first two figures that they've already come out. Janeway has just started shipping to people. That was their, they're doing uh, Janeway, the EMH, and Seven of Nine are coming out. They're doing, I guess, a statue of the Borg Queen. Um, then after that, they've got other figures that I can't, I even know what they're making next, I can't say. But apparently they're going to try and get 14 figures out in 2022. They're doing a phenomenal job. Chrissy, I hope you're digging your figures. Um, so there you go. Terrier, Terrier, all the way from Norway says, it feels just fair that Grace Jones has enslaved me in her rhythm. <laughs> of course, that would be the Trevor Horn produced on ZTT records. Grace Jones slave to the rhythm. I love that. I, I had many versions of that 12 inch. I think I still do somewhere. Mm. Slave to the rhythm. Um, yeah, man. Uh, that is some good shit. Emil Johansson says, I'm excited about the next Bond video game. Uh, I don't know about it, but I've liked the Bond. I like like the, I don't know if you ever played the From Russia With Love video game. I thought that was great. I did love that. I thought it was very, very good. Uh, Jared Snyder says, thanks 
sends me a super chat and says, Hey, Rob, Rob, thank you for sending me to Hellbound. <laughs> I love that. Well, for those of you who don't know, Hellbound is, of course, a Korean series, a six-episode Korean series on Netflix. It comes with my highest recommendation. That shit is dope as fuck. Um, you know what? If you don't know what Hellbound is, don't read anything about it. Just know it's Korean and watch it subtitled like you always should with foreign films. I know some people don't like to read. If, if you don't want to read it, watch the English dub. It's fine, but 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 uh, you got to watch it. But go in cold. Just go. Just know that Rob Burnett says, "Hey, go watch, go watch Hellbound," because it's that shit is dope. It's so good um, and really interesting, really compelling. A lot of thoughtful, interesting ideas. Check it out. Um, you got to check that out. Um, uh, Destiny Captain says, "Rob." What else is good? Season 3 of Stargate SG-1 and on. Also, a lot of the same people that worked on The Expanse worked on Stargate first. Something to think about. Yeah, because they make it in Canada. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, Alexander Wilson, our man. I was good to see you yesterday in the chat. Slavery was abolished in France in 1794 and 1848. And in the UK in 1833. Lincoln only put out the Emancipation Proclamation so that France and the UK wouldn't recognize or support the Confederacy because they still allowed slavery. It makes you think. No, it does. It does make you think. But remember, I mean, look, slavery is an abhorrent practice that has been part of human civilization forever, and it it is uh, it is it's still going on. I was just I was just reading uh, yesterday that people are being enslaved in this country now, and uh, it's it's an abhorrent practice. But yes, that is true. That is true. Uh, that France did uh, stop slavery, and so did the UK. Um, it's really interesting. I was watching a video of one of the, the 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 actor who played Avon Barksdale in The Wire, and he was talking about uh, working in the UK as an actor, as a black man and an actor. Uh, that, the, that the experience because uh, because of that that slavery was banned uh, in the UK in 1833, that um, that for a black actor to go work in the UK. There's a great legacy. I mean, they talk about Shakespeare and that 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 the, they talk about civilization coming from Africa. And there was a pride that he felt uh, being black in the UK that he would never feel here, and the way he was treated and and the, the legacy of of theater and things like that, because so much of of the black experience in America is wrapped up in 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 slavery, and in the UK it was it was different. And I thought that was fascinating. Um, that it was interesting. I mean, he. First of all, to me, everything, I love The Wire. And uh, uh, the acting in that show is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. But it was an interesting, uh, I was I was doing a deep dive into the actors on The Wire and watching all their interviews because I was kind of doing an informal Wire rewatch. show is so fucking good. Those actors are so good. I didn't know Proposition Joe, the actor who played Prop Joe, they found him in like the neighborhood. <laughs> like he wasn't some, I mean, that guy is so good. And... Um, uh, wow, what a show. I fucking love that show. Uh, if you guys haven't seen The Wire, and it, uh, on HBO Max, they do have... So The Wire was shot 4 by 3 I mean, but they had the negative space, so they actually converted it to 16 by 9 And it looks fantastic. Like, when I first watched The Wire, it was in... It was square, 4 by 3 but they've they've remastered it in 16 by 9 And so the version that's on HBO Max is the new remastered Wire. So good. I mean, and you get sucked in, man. And it's kind of a slow burn to start, to be honest. But man, what a what a great ensemble! You know, when you first, I, no one can tell me they knew that Idris Elba was not British. I mean, he, I didn't know he's British. I mean, what I mean is, when I first saw The Wire, I did not know Idris Elba was British. That guy's American accent is so on point, incredible. Um. Alexander Wilson says, a lot of Koreans said the subs for Squid Game loses a lot of nuance. For example, they said that from the way Ali speaks, you can tell that he's never interacted with Koreans outside of his work setting. Um, that's interesting. Uh, wow. Uh, I, I, You know, look, I do think that I, I wish I spoke whenever I, 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 I want to learn Chinese. I want to learn Japanese. And I want to learn Korean. If there's one thing, hopefully I talk about what revolution is going to happen by the end of the end of this decade. 
give me some matrix style shit where I can just program a language into my brain and know how to speak it fluently. If, if I could have like, like it'd be great to, it would be great to fly and shit like that. But what I'd really love is to just speak, if I could have a superpower, it might be to speak any language around the world. I think that'd be the greatest thing ever. Cause then I could go to Japan and, and, and talk and, and tell them what model kits and diecast robots I'm looking for. And I could watch all of my favorite movies and understand them. If I could watch French films and Spanish films and Russian films and whomever, uh, and I knew how to spoke that language or speak the language, I would love that. Like Laurie Anderson, speak my language. Uh, that would be great. And on that note, kids, this episode of Rob's Observations, episode number 767, we're coming up on 800 episodes. And by the way, this is now, this represents, uh, this month is the third anniversary that Rob's Observations has existed. Um, I'm coming up with my, um, uh, I, I, I can't believe I've been doing this for three years because of you, because of the post geek singularity, Alexander Wilson goes on to say his name's Wood Harris. Yes, that's right. Wood, did I not say that? Uh, Wood Harris played Avon Barksdale, uh, who played Avon. A lot of the wires cast were in an HBO miniseries called the corner. A classmate of mine was in it. The corner was so good. I love the corner. Um, and you're right. They were. Um, but yeah, Wood Harris is great. Watch that. Look that up, that interview. I'm sure it's like, I don't know what it would be on. Wood Harris talks about the wire, but, um, it was good. I really, he's, uh, he's a great actor. I mean, Avon Barksdale, great character. All the characters in the wire were great. Um, I love that show. And on, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gentle beings, kind souls, however you identify across these 28 known galaxies. I'm going to bring this episode of Rob Observations to an end. I'll be back tomorrow, of course, with the Hollywood Half and Half. I think I'm going to bring back the Midn Midnighter as well. I think I'm going to do it. A lot of people are like, Rob, not Midnight Metal, but the Midnight Er. Midnight Er. Got to do that during the week. I miss talking to people. I miss lots of my friends who were, I was doing the uh, Midnighter with. And uh, I think it's time to, you know, do that. Why not? Be kind of fun. Yeah? Uh, we shall see. But anyway. I want to thank everyone for generously supporting the channel via tips and super chats and memberships. And once again, member calls, those are so much fun. So thank you guys for that. And uh, I want to thank my moderating staff, the Blue Wrenches, Darren Seeley, Brian Hepburn, Louise X. Sparrow. I love saying that. And by the way, I didn't know that Louise X. Sparrow is a huge Star Trek fan. Uh, like We've never, like, I want to sit down one-on-one -on -one and have a talk with you, Louise. We're going to talk some Trek. Uh, come on down. You're the next contestant. Just you and I. I want to talk Trek with you. Justin's here. Uh, did I miss anybody? Uh, Justin Toner, thank you, sir. And I want to thank everyone for continuing to watch this channel. Tell your friends. What should we do? Fourth season. I want to. I want to make some changes. I want to. I can't just keep doing the same shit. What should Rob Observations season four entail? How can we do this differently? What do you want to see? Tell me. DM me. Slide into my DMs on Twitter. Burnett RM. Send me your ideas. And by the way, you know what? I didn't realize, like, Clubhouse on Twitter, you can do that. Like, you can go on Twitter. And uh, I was actually thinking about, I'm going to try it right now. You will all be witnesses. On Twitter, I think I'm going to go on after these shows, come up with a topic, and go on Twitter and do that Clubhouse business. Because, wouldn't that be cool? I think I'm going to try it today. I don't even know. I mean, I, I did it on my phone. I don't know you, if you can do it on a computer. Like, can I go on Twitter on my computer and use this mic and talk? Because it would be a lot easier than looking around on my phone. We'll see. I don't know. Maybe I'll try it. Actually, maybe I won't. Do I have time? I don't know. Anyway, I want to thank everybody. You guys are great. Remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I say to everyone... Have a better day.